Okay, thank you very much. I'm really, really honored to be here and I hope I will not disappoint you, but what I will do is not, of course, not, I never understood philosophers, but they exist, I will not name them, who are able to do seminars on their own work, you know, like you read a page from your own book and then ask, what did the thinker want to say? <laughs> <laughs> that I'm not able to do. I will simply uh, do, I will do something very simple. I must tell you something which, if you read my work, I hope it, I hope it will not make you sad. I am getting a little bit tired of this, how should I put it ironically, communist propaganda series that I'm doing in defense of lost causes and so on. I'm already for two years doing a book on Hegel. It already, to put it in Stalinist philosophical terms, exists objectively out of my consciousness in objective reality as over 700 pages of the manuscript and it's not yet ended, but my love is there. Uh, why I think we need more than ever pure thinking theory today, I will return to this at the end. Uh, what I want to do is just to pursue a certain line of how capitalism reacts to ecological catastrophes. Of course, I will uh, develop some reflections apropos of two of the latest, not very threatening, at least the first one, but nonetheless known to us all ecological uh, catastrophes that uh, 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 Ash cloud from the Iceland volcano and, of course, the south of Louisiana big oil spill. First, uh, did you notice something? It is my friend from India, Saroy Giri, who is really one of the most gifted new social philosophers that I know and is, from what I can say, a typical victim of, you know that I'm not politically correct and so on, but when I see implicit racism, even I can admit it. Like, because he is from there, he's also an excellent theorist. He did wonderful <coughs> analysis of Laclau, but you, me, critical towards all of us. But the, the reaction in the West is always but you come from there, why don't you write something about Nepal, India, and so on, as if, you know, leave to us pure theory, no? Report, local report. Uh, he <coughs> developed in a, at a conference about the communism in Berlin, where I'm practically coming from uh, a week ago, uh, he developed something uh, wonderful, namely the idea that our public media even are today full of anti-capitalism, that we are even witnessing a kind of overload of the critique of the horrors of capitalism. I mean, if you open up TV, it's always uh, this corrupted bank manager, that corrupted businessman, that company is polluting uh, environment, uh, that other company owns sweatshops where child children work overtime, and so on and so on. There is, however, a catch to this overflow of critique. What is, as a rule, not questioned in this critique, ruthless as it may appear, is the democratic liberal frame of fighting these excesses. That is to say, the explicit or implied goal is to democratize capitalism, <coughs> to e extend the democratic control onto economy, through the pressure of the public me media, parliamentary inquiries, harsher laws, honest police investigations, and so on and so on. But never questioning the democratic institutional frame of the state of law. This democratic institutional frame remains the sacred cow, even for the most radical forms of this, let's call it, ethical anti-capitalism the Porto Alegre Forum, the Seattle Movement. It is here, I think, that the key insight of Marx remains valid, today perhaps more than ever. For Marx, the question of freedom should not be located primarily into the political sphere proper. Does a country have free elections? Are the judges independent? Is the press free from hidden pressures? Are human rights 
rights respected, and the similar list of questions, different, independent or not so independent, Western institutions apply when they want to pronounce a judgment on a country. The key to actual freedom rather resides in the apolitical network of social relations, from market to family and so on, where the change needed if we want an actual improvement is not a political reform, but a change in apolitical social relations of productions. <coughs> So this is a change which cannot be made at the level of democratic elections or other political measures in the narrow sense of the term. We do not vote about who owns what, about relations in a factory and so on. All this is left to processes outside the sphere of the political in the narrower sense of the term. And it is illusory to expect that one can effectively change things by extending democracy into this sphere, say, by organizing democratic banks under people's control. Radical changes in this domain should be made outside the sphere of legal rights and so on. In such democratic procedures, which of course can have a positive role to play, no matter how radical our anti-capitalism is, the solution is sought in applying democratic mechanisms which one should never forget are part of the state apparatus which guarantees the undisturbed functioning of the capitalist reproduction. In this sense only, although I find this statement today problematic, Alain Badiou was right, or at least made the right point, with his crazy claim that today the name of the ultimate enemy is not capitalism, exploitation or anything similar, but democracy. The democratic illusion the acceptance of democratic mechanisms as the ultimate <coughs> friend of every change. And let me avoid the misunderstanding here. What I just said doesn't mean, so, haha, no democracy but coup d'etat, killing, and so on and so on. <laughs> what I'm saying is that democracy restrained to what we are perceiving as the core of the democratic process multi-party elections, state of law, and so on, is not enough. That a, a different, let's call it, social, political mobilization, which I'm more and more inclined even still to call democratic, should, is the place where things should happen. Uh, it, what I find so interesting is how uh, it's strictly correlative to this apparently ruthless critique of capitalism, but again, if you look at it closely, it's always directed, this kind of critique, at excesses which are not read in a classical Marxian, Freudian way as symptoms, that is to say as necessary excesses, as something which <coughs> registered uh, a necessary flaw in the system, but as simple excesses which one could, uh, one could, uh, one could uh, abolish, I don't know, through better legislation and so on and so on. So what is crucial for me is that the strict opposite to this personalized anti-capitalism, where I even think that sometimes this personalized anti-capitalism can be so brutal that although I know that people there often attacking a uh, scum, I feel also some sympathy for the victims. I do remember a year and a half ago the scandal with Bernard Madoff. Okay, of course, a scum should be arrested, whatever. But I didn't like how they personalize it. First, you know, he was a bad guy, but as such, he was just the extreme point of following the logic of the system. He was a typical postmodern capitalist with, with, you know, by postmodern I mean, first you gather billions, then you give, uh, uh, then you give half back for charity and so on and so on. So <laughs> what I'm saying is that this overload of fanatical but personalized, we like concrete bad guys, not 
what is wrong with the system itself. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, overload of vulgar anti-capitalist criti anti -capitalist criticism is just one side of the global phenomenon. Its other side is different attempts to what we may call the postmodern ethical capitalism. The idea is, and it's again quite honorable idea, I'm not a priori opposed to it. The idea is that one can render the ecological and social responsibility profitable. As they like to put it in their new age terminology, the partisans of this orientation, that uh, this idea of, on the one hand, sleazy private capitalist amassing profit, on the other hand, those who care for the global good, that this is still uh -huh, the old paradigm, you know? that in the new emerging paradigm, the two dimensions can go together. Again, uh, up to a point they can, but up to a point, who do I mean by this? Maybe you know this movement, again, nothing bad about it, I only think it has limits, it's, I'm referring her to the movement of so-called natural capitalism, instigated by Peter Hawking. Uh, what they propose is a kind of new revolution in production, comparable to the first industrial revolution, which, as we all know, generated a breathtaking material development, but at an immense cost to the earth. Depletion of natural wealth, loss of the topsoil, destruction of species, and so on and so on. In order to counteract this destructive tendency, we have to change our entire approach. Till now, we included into the price of commodities only what we have to invest to produce them, ignoring the costs to nature. Our prosperity was thus illusory, since by way of ruthlessly exploiting natural resources, we were drawing our income not from earnings but from principle, from inherited wealth. The sum of this inherited wealth is natural capital. The store of commodities produced by nature in the billions of years of its development. Commodities like water, minerals, trees, soil, air, plus all living systems, grasslands, forests, oceans, and so on. All these living systems not only supply non-renewable resources for our material production, they also render services indispensable for our survival regeneration of atmosphere, soil, fertilization, and so on. So, here is the proposal. To our standard notion of capital as stored value, we should add the economic value of nature as a system, as well as the value of human resources. We thus obtain four forms of capital. Financial capital, investments, monetary instruments, manufactured capital, machines, the entire infrastructure, natural capital, resources, living systems, and human capital, labor, intelligence, culture, organization. Admitting the difficulty of assigning monetary value to, for the time being, at least non-substituable services like the oxygen production by plants, uh, natural capitalists nonetheless risk estimates according to which, for example, the worldwide oxygen production is worth 36 trillion dollars annually. And as they like to point out, more or less the same as the gross world product. Or they claim the monetary value of all human capital is three times greater than all financial and manufactured capital. So the idea of natural capitalism is to change radically our accountancy by way of treating as the capital which should be enriched through its expanded reproduction all the four components, not only the first two. This can be done, they claim, Peter Hawking and his colleagues, in four main ways. First, radical resource productivity promoting industrial efficiency, and so on. Second point, biomimicry, eliminating waste by redesigning industrial systems on biological lines. Three, a service and flow economy, shifting from a perception of wealth as goods and purchases 
to a perception of value as desired services and satisfaction of human needs. And last way, investing in natural capital, developing markets for activities which enhance and restore our environment. So that's the position. I hope it was at least clear this is the position I was describing, not my position. Why? Because you know that something quite comical is happening if you allow me a brief two minutes tour, which makes me a little bit depressed. What that guy, Adam Kirsch, who attacked me two years ago in New Republic started, is now circulating in France, in already three German newspapers and so on. Namely, they quote a passage from my In Defense of Lost Causes, where I clearly, unambiguously, describing a position which, of course, is not mine. The position of what Jean-Claude Milner, in his very weird book called Criminal Tendencies of Modern Europe, his thesis is that European Union is, he directly claims this, I'm not like extrapolating in that, that European Union is a continuation of Hitler with other means. And this is why the only solution for Europe is to eliminate the Jews. That it's still, that, I mean, Milner doesn't claim this, he is a Zionist. He claims that this is the reality of Europe. I describe this position. And it's incredible. Again and again, this is quoted as a proof that I am a radical anti-Semite uh, uh, advising the uh, mass killing of all Jews. And it's incredible how I tried to write to newspapers in Germany, the last one was the Zeit, I think, I think which published this, a letter where I explained unambiguously that I am describing another guy's position. The answer I got was a very brutal ironic that now I'm trying to squeeze out by claiming that I didn't quite mean what I wrote there. <laughs> it's really been strange times, but sorry for this thing. <laughs> so now comes my opinion. <laughs> the first approach, it, might, it may appear that such a radical redefinition of capital has beneficial effects. And Undoubtedly, it has them. Of course, you have to change all strategy. Why not? I think there are nonetheless first unsurmountable empirical problems here. If this redefinition is to become even minimally operative, it would demand an incredibly complex worldwide state control and regulation like some state or whatever agency must determine the price of natural commodities and then must enforce them onto the market and so on. So what I'm saying is that although Peter, this is the first contradiction I see, and it's a typical contradiction, I had a nice public fight, a friendly one, but nonetheless it was shouting, but friendly shouting <laughs> with, with uh, Tony Negri, also, but you had it uh, uh, in, uh, in Berlin, where my basic problem with Negri developed again his notion of multitude, claiming that that's the new positive productivity, the new political subjectivity, and you know, he then exploded in his aesthetic dream. Can't we see communism is practically here? Uh, capitalists are purely parasitic, we just have to cut them off, and we are there, one step from communism. I told him that doesn't he see that, A, all examples that he gives of multitude, I hope you would agree at least here with me, strictly presuppose not only a minimal, uh, 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 a minimal law and order, but even a very strong state guaranteeing many things. And point two, that all the most convincing examples that he gives of multitude are political, sorry, are examples within capitalism. So that I simply see no foundation in what he describes of how to pull this miracle to cut off the capitalists and to generalize the model of multitude to the entire society. So then I, okay, he told me you don't understand anything because you are a Hegelian. Okay. <laughs> okay, treat me as an idiot and give me 
one simple, I told him even more viciously, treat me as an Anglo-Saxon idiot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and give him at least one empirical example of a multitude which wouldn't be just this poetic, you know, multitude of postmodern capitalists speculating on Wall Street, this is Negri's favorite topic of communists, not today, but like where multitude really started to function on its own. And he was a little bit perplexed, and then he said, well, Chinese cultural revolution. And you know, me and Badiou, we were a little bit shocked because, I mean, if there ever was a failure, that was one. <laughs> I mean, uh, for me, no, quite seriously, you know, where is my problem with uh, Negri here? Again, I appreciate him very much. I said publicly in Berlin, at some level, I am with Negri even against Badiou. The problem with Badiou for me is the same problem as with all these, let's call them French or French-oriented political philosophers. Ranciere, up to a point he's getting better now, and far, uh, uh, Ernesto Laclau, and so on. Did you notice how there is de facto no role of, in no role, no place for what in Marxism we call critique of political economy in their work? I mean, but you is quite open here. He says openly, economy, that's the domain of uh, human animal, of utilitarian gains, and so on and so on. It has nothing to do with authentic, with authentic politics. Here, I agree with Negri. Economy is the place where the struggle should be won or lost. But uh, where I, again, where I disagree with Negri is in what? I claim that, and he admitted this to me when we talked there, Negri is still a, a, a fanatic, in a good sense, I don't use this word here in an ironic sense, of the secret history of 20th century, which was, as for any, democratic leftists, this story of immediate democracy, councils, Soviets, whatever. And they see the 20th century as one big kidnapping or reappropriation of authentic revolutionary outburst, which was done at the level of Soviets and so on, by the state bureaucracy and so on. Some of my, nothing against them, they are my friends, I appreciate it, but nonetheless, some of my Trotskyite friends here in the UK have the same dream. The way they describe in the 20th century is, can't you see, they say, okay, sorry, I'm blind, myopic, I don't say that. Can't you see how, for example, Solidarnos was a workers' movement council which was somehow mysteriously then kidnapped by, by the church, CIA, whomever you want, and so on and so on. I think that the lesson of the Chinese cultural revolution is much more tragic one. What we should abandon, here I agree with Badiou, is not only the state socialist form of the left of the 20th century, what we usually call communist states, although, again, we should still maybe learn something from their experience, but as a forum it's over, not only, I go a step further, should we abandon, not, again, it's not a question of totally abandoning, but the form as such is no longer uh, workable. The so-called social democratic welfare state, and may, we are now noticing with 20 years delay that not only communist totalitarianism <coughs> did die in 1990, but I think also the social democratic welfare state. And if you allow me again a brief improvisation, I wonder if you agree. You are here my liberal fellow traveler. I hope you don't take it personally if I characterize you. I do not Marxist like. These were people whom they tolerated, but then at a certain point they had to be sent to Gulag and so on. No? <laughs> Bourgeois intelligence, you know. Somehow you fit this, don't ask me why. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, I hope you will, uh, you will, uh, uh, I hope you will agree with this that with, with uh, 20 years delay, we see that again, social democracy is also losing ground, and something which genuinely worries me is 
Not only the fact about which I've written a lot, how in China and France a certain new model is emerging with a capitalism more efficient than ours, but at the same time with, at least I think, no need for democracy. This is something very harsh to swallow, you know, because again, as I wrote in my, I think, the previous book, I, uh, uh, you know, one thing you can say about capitalism, if you are honest, that uh, we should, as Catholics like to pick it, first give to the devil what belongs, what belongs to that earth. Uh, although you have here and there 10, 20 years of dictatorship, Chile, South Korea, but when things start to function again, always in the long term democracy did generate some kind of demand for democracy. With all the bourgeois limitation, blah, blah, but it did it. What I worry is that now we have a new form of capitalism which unfortunately no longer does. And it's even more efficient than our capitalism. So, something to worry. But uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, let's forget about this, let's look at Europe. Uh, is not the part of this deep crisis, it's not, it's not disappearing, of all social democracies? I think a kind of a new division of political space. Let me simplify things to the articles. Till recently, our political space was structured so that usually you have a left of center and right of center party. These were usually the two populist parties. No, not in a rest of the cloud sense, but populist in the simple sense of addressing as voters the entire population. And then you have <coughs> parties which consciously or out of necessity limited their appeal to a certain strata, like Green Party, Old Left Fringe, or Neo-Fascist, or whatever. I claim that now, I wonder if you agree sincerely, you have no bad jobs. Uh, 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 a new polarity is emerging. We have more and more, on the one hand, what I cannot by call a neutral pro-capitalist country, and it's not necessarily bad. It's usually a country for pure, efficient capitalism, but at the same time liberal. Usually multiculturalist, pro-abortion, all that stuff. And the opponent, which is emerging, the main opposition, is usually uh, uh, some kind of a populist, fundamentalist, anti-immigrant reaction to it. This is clearly a situation in, in now re-emerging again and again in most of the post-communist East European new members of the European Union were ex-communists who tried to play the role of the left of center party are simply disappearing and take Poland. You have uh, Donald Tusk, pure liberal, apolitical, of course, falsely, but a theoretical and so on. We are just trying to build a tolerant working capital system and then you have the Twiddle D and Twiddle Dan. Uh, okay, now it's only Twiddle D. <laughs> but you know what I mean, no? And, and the same thing is in Hungary, but not only there. They told me in Norway that there also this anti-immigrant party is the second one already. They fear that in Dutch it will become. And this dynamic, which is exclusively the dynamic of liberalism, and not a kind of radical liberalism, but this traditional market liberalism versus right-wing anti-immigrant nationalism, I claim this is, I will not go into it, but I claim this is a very, a very dangerous uh, dynamic. So let me now return after this short detour to my basic line. So what I'm trying to say is that the first thing to say here would you agree, when we debate with liberals, we shouldn't say, no, no, you are the bourgeois enemies. We should tell them, we also like very much your freedoms, but only a new strong dose of the left in the long term will redeem, that's my sincere belief, will save what is worth saving in your freedoms. Otherwise, you will be slowly losing ground and forced to concede more and more, more and more uh, to the extreme right. I mean, Jean-Marie Jean Le Pen, who is unfortunately not an idiot, uh, formulated this very nicely when at some elections he lost, and he said he was quite right. We 
loss because we won, in the sense of because the center parties, in a more civilized way, if you want, integrated our problematic. You know how liberals or standard democratic like to say, they say, of course we condemn Le Pen. It's horrible, disgusting. No place in our civilized societies. But then comes a but. They say but. They are manipulating and addressing legitimate fears of the people, so in other words, we should do it in a more softer way, and so on and so on. So, uh, uh, the first thing we should say is, I think, change the entire terrain. Like, the big enigma for me is, what that this midterm, which even some leftists like Negri uh, buy, that the nation state is disappearing and so on. Is the state effectively getting stronger and stronger? I think that in today's economy, where you have the hero of intellectual property, all the ecological concerns, and so on and so on, international situation, I think literally state apparatuses are getting stronger and stronger, and so on. So, back to my line, this is the first problem with uh, natural capitalism. I cannot even imagine how concretely to do it with, without a gigantic state. But more fundamentally, the problem with natural capitalism, for me, resides in the very form of commodity and market exchange. The problem for me with the basic notion of natural capitalism is that it reads like a friend from Iran, okay, maybe not an objective source, told me about the first sex and marriage guide recently published in Saudi Arabia. It's a very interesting book, he told me. Why its form is that of a modern manual. It imitates this decadent Western manuals. Its content is the traditional patriarchal advice. So in this form, as you know, easy light, chat, how to greet marriage. You get then advices how to beat your wife without hurting her too much and so on and so on. <laughs> uh, with Hawking is the opposite, I claim that is the case. New Ecological concerns are squeezed into the old capitalist form, so that instead of overcoming commodification, one extends it ad absurdum. So that you notice the basic operation. Basically, they try to save the ecological problem so that everything becomes a commodity. And Hawking at some point even says everything that nature did in the last, I don't know how to come to this number, 3.6 billion years, is this the date of the uh, bank, I don't know, all that should be considered as a commodity. And we should try, we should try to formulate its, its price. So again, from the air we breathe to our human abilities, everything is a commodity. Now, incidentally, this is the same mistake, so that you will not say that I'm only making fun of this commodity capitalism. It's a, a mirror image of the same mistake made in, in, in the last stage by the communist countries. Like I met at a conference a guy who is now one of the top computer specialists, but in the last 10 years, 15 years of the East Germany, communist Germany, he was one of their wunderkinds, allowed not to go to the West, but to read literature of the West uh, doing with digitalization. And he told me how they made a similar mistake. They totally misread the social consequences of what we call computerization, digital revolution. On the contrary, they thought that digital revolution is what will finally make communism workable. They considered that planning doesn't function, but they claimed because social needs are so fluctuating and so on, that central bureaucracy simply cannot do it. But they thought with modern megacomputers, you see that image was also, that notion was also kind of a primitive or value of a couple of big megacomputers in some state agency, that finally these computers will be strong enough to take into account all the fluctuations of the needs of different strata of populations and finally communism will become workable. Again, what they did is that they simply didn't get it what well. The irony I read a lot about this is still beautiful, I think. Because, you know, we may doubt this Marxist dogma about, you know, the vulgar one, of how, you know, when forces of production get in contradiction with 
relations of production, then evolution. So, but uh, it certainly did help this dogma for the last 20 years of communist countries. It's clear that what ruined them was what fashionably we described as a passage for traditional industrial to whatever we call it, post-industrial capitalism. That was their end. But something similar is doing Hawking, I think. In the same way that the dead air communist bureaucrats were saying, oh, mega computers, wonderful, finally uh, communism will work, he thinks, oh, we universalize the notion of commodity so that everything is a commodity, not only a commodity, but a capital, which we should care for it so that it uh, is regenerated properly, and the problem of ecology is uh, saved. Uh, I think this is problematic. Why? Because while Hawking maintains the basic capitalist matrix, profit through expanded self-reproduction, proposing to save it from its and our self-destruction through its excessive universality, proposing to save it through, precisely through its excessive universalization, the core of the problem remains, which resides in this very form, profit-seeking as the motive of economic reproduction. I claim that no matter how much we expand the notion of capital, the very form of capital presupposes a structural gap between reality, the use value of products and services, and the real of the financial circulation, reproduction which generates profit, where the first is subordinated to the second. In other words, insofar as we remain within capitalism, even if we expand the notion of capital to all reality, this reality will continue to function as an indifferent, ultimately expendable staff whose goal is to serve profit making. So again, I'm claiming that this is kind of a mirror illusion of the illusion of the East German uh, communist bureaucrats. Where can we see the limit of this approach, if you allow me another, like, I did already 5% if I wanted to... No, you can go on for another 15 minutes, really, if you want to, it's choice. 15? 15, 15 one time, 20. Look, you've gone on to 730, 1930. Is that not enough? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this metaphysical linear notion of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this said, was made. Yeah, I said I'd be your dominatrix for the evening. Yeah, but you should say, you should wait for the evening. But you should take this in the same way when Stalin said, Comrades, please criticize me. <laughs> you have 20 minutes left. You deserve not gulag, but re education. <laughs> of the left. This is how politics is done. You cannot say really, I am, no, 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 I'm making a very fine point. Do you know, which I hope so, do you know the paradox of the performative? How by saying something you create it. But if you notice a paradox, if you read it closely, how? And even John Searle, who is not the highest on my talk of these guys, uh, uh, speech act theorists, notice nicely this paradox that the only way to do a performative is to put it in a fetishized way so that you do something not by saying that you are doing something, but by reporting it as already done. You close a session by saying this session is closed. 
And in the same way, I think it's exactly the same problem in a political movement. You cannot say, now I'm starting something which will. You have to say, we, and we all know that this we will maybe exist as the result of what I'm saying now. I'm so sad, but this is counted already as a debate. It's not included in the 20 minutes. But <laughs> 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 now, right, if you know, now, another digression, but it's a beautiful one. Yeah, yeah. You know the guy, uh, the guy uh, François Bayard, a French writer, who wrote some wonderful paradoxical books like the one about Agatha Christie, the murder of Roger Ackroyd, where in a totally naive proof that the solution there is the wrong one. Not the narrator, but his sister did it. She now wrote a book of uh, anticipatory, how do you call it, plagiarism. Like, yeah, where he demonstrates how, for example, the only way to read properly Maupassant is, 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 is that he plagiarized uh, uh, Proust who comes after him. <laughs> <laughs> but what he claims is that sometimes writers do write in this way that the only way to truly get what they arrive at, what were, they, they were doing, is to read them retroactively, but Nonetheless, at the factual level, they themselves created this future to which. So this would be my we. I refer to it, but if things will not turn too bad, maybe through other idiots like me who refer to it, there will be this part. Okay, so let me go on. Okay. I will really try to squeeze it. End of jokes. Uh, how all this works with ecology? Okay, two problems. Uh, first, this oil spill. Unfortunately, this is what I mean by, I would just like to illustrate what I developed at the beginning about this how this parliamentary legal state forum is not enough. Uh, the Louisiana oil spill. You know Freud's dream on Irma's injection. What's the horror? First, this terrifying look into Irma's throat. You see the horror. Then three idiots come, three doctors who provide ridiculous reasons for why the treatment didn't work. So you have a trauma and then uh, a symbolic comedy. That exactly was the structure, of course, in Washington. We saw the trauma, which was, you remember that undersea TV show of the, that get oil spilling out, and then we had the three idiots, uh, the representatives of British Petroleum, Transocean, Halliburton, each of them playing this stupid game, putting the blame onto another. But more said, not only was this an undignified comedy, uh, Obama also disappointed me here, because I think that even some conservatives noted this. The problem was that his reaction, at least till recently, remained too much in this formal democratic legal domain. He was looking for a legal culprit. You know, he even said once something which is at a certain common sense level patently not true. He said, it's BP's problem. No, sorry, it's not BP's. I know he didn't mean it in this way. He meant like, who is guilty, it's BP's problem. But I'm sorry to tell you, it's not BP's problem. It's the problem of the millions of people there. Not only the United States, even Northern Cuba, Mexico, spreading around. And what I'm simply saying is that, uh, and when Obama said, I almost became sympathetic to BP when Obama said, you know, I will kick them in the ass and so on. Of course, they should be kicked in the ass. But the first thing to say is that, A, the problem, don't you think that the problem is way too serious to approach it in this legal responsibility sense, I will make BP pay every cent. That's nonsense. So much is already destroyed that the statement is meaningless. Point two. Now, I'm not paid by BP, but <laughs> my God, isn't it that up to a certain point at all, it's contingent that it was BP on whose field this accident happens. Don't all of them use basically the same mechanisms and so on, machinery. So probably at least up to, maybe BP was, I don't know, a little bit worse than others, but it could have happened with somebody else and so on. So isn't it that what should be done is A, 
a much larger mobilization, not only state playing legal games, but mobilizing ecological plans, mobilizing people in Louisiana. I would even have been, at least they would have been doing something something much more rational than fighting wars in Afghanistan, mobilizing the army, uh, starting to ask questions, how do we deal with this kind of problems, and so on. I mean, problems explode here, which, again, that's my point, so that you will not suspect me of some, that by criticizing just the frame of formal democracy that I am already dragging behind, I don't know, Comrade Stalin and his leftists. No, I'm speaking about even more radical democratic mobilization, not only in the sense of mobilization like wider circle of people, but also a, at a different level. It's not a legal game of culprits, it's a game of our way of life, of how we have to change it, why do we drill oil, and so on and so on. Uh, there is, I think, more truth than in these legal games in us. Wonderful anecdote that happened to, I cannot resist it, Ted Kennedy. I don't know if you know it. Uh, 30 years ago, Ted Kennedy, who was still alive, was, they, they had already a debate in, in Senate about oil drilling. No, about, sorry, about offshore drilling. And Kennedy was opposed. Then something happened. The irony is that exactly there, off south of New Orleans, where oil is spilling now, Kennedy was caught by a senator by a paparazzo, well, <coughs> doing some drilling. That is to say, <laughs> to them, uh, uh, making love. It's unambiguous, I saw the photos. And then, people uh, started to appreciate Republicans. Then, at the next session of Senate, a Republican senator turned to Ted Kennedy and said, I'm glad to see that Senator Kennedy has changed his position on offshore drilling. <laughs> <laughs> but Kennedy said, denied, and I think Kennedy, our slogan should be, Kennedy's offshore drilling is the only offshore drilling acceptable. <laughs> 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 Why? Okay, I guess that's the topic, but what I am, what I am, uh, let me, for a similar, okay, since the time of the end is approaching, I would like to point to another track of how, here I would like to refer even to some people who are generally associated with LSC, your school, Ulrich Beck. Again, I don't fully agree with him, but there are definitely things to be learned from Ulrich Beck. Especially something which is more than actual confronting all these ecological problems. Uh, Ulrich Beck, I think, was the first to draw attention to the wonderful ambiguity and novelty of the term we all use, expert opinion. My God, even when I was young, experts didn't have opinions. They knew it. We, common sense idiots, had opinions. Because the expert, he tells you how things are. But did you notice how now, precisely when science is pervading all our spheres of life, all of a sudden, you don't get from, from experts the truth, you get opinions. He thinks that, the other guy thinks that, and here I must unfortunately disappoint you. I think there is an inherent proof in it. That is to say, even with global warming, I don't buy those leftist paranoiac story who claim that doubts about global warming are simply the result of some dishonest uh, biologists and so on being bribed by big companies. Of course, there is probably that. But there are effectively uncertainties. My conclusion is only this doesn't mean we can go on exploiting nature. It means that the situation is even more open. We, we really don't know that the causality is so non-transparent, uh, which, uh, which is by another thing. The, the mythic notion which we all use, and it's, I think, pure ideology, is limit value. What you usually get from experts is a limit value. Like, now it's fashionable to say, we can afford two degrees Celsius of heating. But this is, to are we aware that this is totally mythical? I mean, usually we take, you know, it's the same as, I spoke with a lawyer in the United States, where they try to fixate at what point your Holocaust denial becomes a crime. And they're not kidding. They are now the, the number that is emerging is, don't ask me why, is 5,150,000.
And I told them, are you crazy? Like, if I said the Nazis killed 5 million, 160,000, I'm good guy. If I say no, they killed only 5, uh, 5 million, 140,000, I'm a Holocaust denier. It's a Holocaust denier. So, again, uh, another consequence of this uncertainty of ours is the following one. Did you notice how you know, for a long time, I thought that we have the Marxist mantra, which is, even these natural catastrophes are mostly caused by our human hubris of ruthless exploitation of nature. But I claim there is something hypocritical about it. In what sense? I claim that uh, this is, don't forget, also good news for us, because if we are the cause of it, then all we have to do is change our way of life and we are out of trouble. But sorry to tell you, although I fully agree with this thesis of social mediation of many natural catastrophes, like the story I even, I think, repeated here two years ago, or the last time, about China, how serious geologists there think that the, the catastrophic two or three years ago earthquake in Sichuan was caused by the Three Gorges Dam. Because the water there, the new lakes, is exactly above the subterranean cliffs where the movements set, set, in motion, uh, uh, set in motion the earthquake, and the idea is that it's, uh, the large amount of water there changed the whole pressure and so on and so on. But isn't it at the same time something else going on? Again, in this way we can save the innocence of nature and so on. We, we can avoid the very traumatic fact that you know, not only us humans are crazy, nature is also crazy. And things can happen. Asteroid, earthquake, whatever you want, and we basically can do anything. So I think that in all this idea of, oh my God, we should recycle, we should pollute less, it is a little bit of a superstitious activity. It, like, you know that it really doesn't matter, but you do it because somehow it makes your conscious clear. It's a little bit like, you know, if you are doing it, I'm not an anti-patriotic, but uh, uh, now, in this football match where we Slovenes, you know, we hated you because you screwed us up, which is why we were all for Germany, because then you get the message you gave us to Slovenes uh, a week later from Germany. Uh, but, uh, you know, like, when you watch TV at home, you shout, boys, uh, you know this is meaningless, they don't hear. <laughs> this, you know, an old lady I know lives next to me, Carefully throws all bottles there. Who, who I'm helping nature to recuperate and so on. There is some. There, there, uh, there is something. There is something. Uh, uh, there is something about this. So what I'm saying again is that uh, uh, again science cannot uh, replace uh, cannot replace politics here and now. To conclude, it may surprise you, I think, two points I want to make here. The first point is a horrible one. This is how far I go to what I would have called the rehabilitation of people. Ask me, but you appear that you are a little bit even for terror. No, I'm not, but I'm ready to say something. <laughs> we have something that Alain Badiou calls the eternal constant invariant of revolutionary egalitarian justice, composed of four features. Strict egalitarian justice, terror, voluntarism, and trust in the people. You can guess from this that Badiou is a Maoist. But just to provoke you, I would like to say something. But will not the ecological crisis at some point force us to do something along these lines? Look, strict egalitarian justice. Everyone knows we will have to apply it. We, we in the West cannot play the games to the third world countries. Sorry, we already spent the resources, so we can pollute it at a larger extent. You should. We, we will have to somehow, how should I put it, uh, give equal right to every individual, at least to pollute. Terror, absolutely, I claim. It will have to be, of course, not terror in the Stalinist sense, but a kind of a strict control overseeing even up to, I love it, that the Time magazine, 
at some point, you know, they didn't proclaim that the person of the year, but celebrated whistleblowers, you know, people from companies who denounce you to the police. Okay, as an old Stalinist, as I'm accused, I loved it, you see. Those who denounce you to the police, yes, they will have to be in some way perceived as new heroes. And incidentally, in the United States, they are, because they don't get nothing, they just get threats from because then voluntarism, absolutely. But this I mean in, the, in an anti-Marxist way. If by traditional Marxism we mean this strange trust into the logic of history. You know, Marxists have this trust. Things are moving and even if things look bad now, history is on our side. We are realizing historical tendency. No, we are not. And the last point, trust to the people. That by this I mean that uh, I don't believe that either experts or state can do it. Tremendous things will have to be done. For just think about five minutes, promise. And linear time, no, that is it. Uh, just think about uh, Iceland. Imagine that the outburst, that the explosion of that volcano would uh, were to be a stronger so that it can easily happen. The whole of Iceland becomes uninhabitable. Now, we don't even have mechanisms of deciding what to do then. Should they disperse around the world? Do. And here, I agree with you, is the true problem of we. Who will be the we who will decide? No, you go there. I don't know. Putin says, oh, oh, since you were so kind, your banks to allow us to, to, to launder our mafia's money, no? Just <laughs> <laughs> even that the Russian mafia is the main culprit beneath the uh, 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 collapse, that we give you part of Siberia. Siberia is a greater problem. You know that Siberia is now getting warmer. The idea is that in 10, 20 years it will become much more inhabitable. There are some other problems, gases, release poisonous, but nonetheless, <laughs> can move there. On the other hand, you have parts of the world, sub-Saharan and so on, more and more desert. Again, I think it will be quite a serious prospect very soon to, we will be faced with the urgency of large movements of people. We cannot do it in the old way. This is nothing new. It happened many times in the history of humanity, but it happened spontaneously and through extreme violence, millions died, and so on and so on. We know that we simply cannot afford it. So again, who, how will do it? This is what I mean to avoid the misunderstanding by communism. I don't mean any Comrade Lenin is back or whatever. I simply mean that, and this is just one example, that we are facing problems for which capital market, that is to say, and the state in the narrow legal sense, parliamentary democracy, state of law, is not enough. That a different form of transnational mobilization, don't ask me how it will happen, will have to be necessary. I absolutely claim that there should be no continuity between this communism and what happened in the 20th century. Why not? Because, as we all know, if anything, the ecological and so on record of ex-communist countries is even much worse than it, the debt of capitalist countries. Why do I still insist on the name communism for a simple, it's not so simple, reason that, A, it's really, this, all these problems are problems of commons enclosure of commons, our shared commons, earth, intellectual property, and so on. And point two, I don't like the word socialism. Never forget, so, uh, Nazism was not national communism, it was national socialism. And I precisely, because I appreciate liberalism, I will put it like this. You know that Nazis were right when they claimed the opposition between liberalism and communism should not deceive you. They are much closer to it. Or as Otto Weininger, you know, the crazy anti-feminist, anti-Semite said very bluntly, and he was right. The difference between socialism and communism is that socialism is Aryan and communism is Jewish. In a way, yes. Because, you know, in socialism we have always an aspect of this organic community and so on and so on. Just to conclude, really, now, you can say I'm crazy, what I want is impossible. Who will do it? Oh, 
I just would like to conclude with a very brief reflection on the world, in, on the work impossible. Did you notice how strangely this work functions in our public discourse? We have two extremes. When we are dealing with personal freedoms, sexuality and so on, or scientific prospects of change, uh, the phrase is anything is possible. Impossible is becoming possible. You know, we will be able, I don't know, to visit stars, uh, to have multiple orgasms. I was even told I not to go into dirty sexual details, but uh, everything is possible. But at the same time, in social relations, things are less and less possible. It is as if you know, we will be able to visit stars, but if you want a little bit more welfare state, that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> it is very nice. And what I'm saying is that this impossibility, which is usually published as maturity, we are finally becoming mature, there are things which you cannot do, is not an objective impossibility, it's precisely where politics should intervene. A true intervention, intervention is not an intervention within the scale of what goes on, where you pick up the best, the best possibility. Sometimes you have to take risks and do the impossible. And you succeed and the impossible in this sense becomes possible. And you can even be non-democratic here. Ah, ah, before you accuse me of being a totalitarian, with this I really conclude, yes. patient, patient. You are too nervous. You know, yin yang, balance. <laughs> okay, let me finish. Okay. You are now in my black book, you know. <laughs> in other words, something really dangerous is happening. And I can tell you we are not even you are not even uh, the worst here in the UK. It's the same in Germany, it's the same in France, in my own country, and so on and so on. So I claim to all those who think, oh, now is the time for struggle and so on. Yes, but also for struggle to think. In these situations they are today, that we are today, as a Marxist, I'm not preaching a new revolution. As I always repeat, my thesis of Feuerbach today is the thesis of Feuerbach turned around. In the 20th century, we were maybe trying to change the world a little bit too fast. Maybe it's the time to interpret it more radically. I mean, we are living in times where we don't have any traditional ethical or whatever religious orientation which can tell us where do we stand, which can give us cognitive and ethical map, <coughs> cognitive and ethical mapping. We have to think, we have to do radical thinking. And whatever their failures, corruption and so on are, without universities this doesn't work. In other words, even Democracy itself, I'm not critical even about parliamentary democracy. All I'm saying is it's not authentic in itself. There can be elections where you have this emphatic emotion, my God, a miracle. Right? There are elections which it's clearly seen that are simply uh, uh, media manipula manipulated and so on. But to have this kind of authentic elections, you don't do it without universities. We are laying the foundation, and we shouldn't be afraid and falsely modest. Let me really conclude last sentence <laughs> by something that Terry Eagleton told me years ago that one big Marxist historian, I'm not sure if it was Eric Hobsbawm or not, probably not, uh, had a strange experience in Oxford. He went to some factory 34 years ago giving a talk to workers, and he was, of course, in this pseudo-populist way, patronizingly fraternizing with them. He began with, you know, I'm not here as the one who knows. I'm here just to debate with you. I will learn from you in the same way that you will learn from me. And Terry told me, one worker stood up and gave him a wonderful answer. He used the F word, the word. He said, fuck off. Of course you should know. You are paid to know. You are here to teach us. Don't patronize us. In this sense, we shouldn't take our knowledge as an arrogance, but as a great responsibility. I mean, I'm, uh, expert knowledge is nice, but especially today, when the field is so 
totally confused that more is needed and that more is our duty to give it. I'm sorry if I was too long and thanks very much. status in the medical profession in the UK, you become a surgeon, you're yeah. just a mister, you're no longer a doctor, you have risen above the status. And I think given that there's so many people here today and you're so widely appreciated, you're obviously, you know, above the professor. That's why we miss, you missed him. <laughs> I know this sophism, I know this <laughs> <laughs> You know when an idiot gives me a manuscript which is bullshit. Okay. <laughs> to be able to, it, to say you are above today's times, your time didn't yet come. <laughs> now it's your turn. It's very hard for you to stay quiet just for a few moments. But now it's your turn to do something difficult, which is to stay quiet, whilst the audience asks you questions. So we're going to take questions in several clusters, is that alright? Well please get five or six questions out. In, so one, in one go. I so hope I'm not to see now. So we'd like oh, uh, is the growing weather mics. There are mics on both sides. In order to uh, um, get as many of your voices out as possible, please keep your questions short. That means yeah, no statements, short well. questions. <laughs> right, go. Short and concise as my dog was. Yes. <laughs> Do not use the talk as an example. Exactly. Um, Hans, where do I see the first question? Yes. Please. So Just, I hope that it's loud enough. I, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, you say that uh, mainstream liberal democratic post political uh, parties pick the populist right anti immigration parties yeah. as their opposition in, um, uh, I suppose, at the expense of the radical left. What happens when there's a mainstreaming of that populist right? anti-immigration argument, whereby they become part of the liberal, democratic, yeah. post-political mainstream. That's it. To be very sure. Uh, uh, no, not yet. <laughs> no, more questions. Shh, shh, shh. It's hard, it's so hard, I know. It's so hard to sit there. Okay. Now you have some truth spent in Germany. In of course. Hans, questions? Yes, lady there. Um, in the oil spill example, you argued for a radical democra um, democratic mobilization, um, but those things seem to depend on the institutions of a democracy, which you kind of dismissed at the beginning. So I wondered if you can just talk about that. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Great question. Over here. Anybody? Yes. The guy with his hand up. How can this uh, new left um, protect itself from aligning itself, as it so often does, with right-wing forces that are coming out of, say, the Middle East or many Islamic countries at the moment? Okay. Um, <coughs> Centre? You're all quite... Yes. Yeah. I think if I understood correctly, there was some contradiction uh, in your... Uh, um, <laughs> to, to say the least, um, in, in, in terms of how you approach, approach the environmental issue yeah. um, that you referred to uh, changes in Serbia and uh, the sub-Saharan changes and then uh, you said that uh, environmental living, uh, pro-environmental living uh, was superstitious. Um, so, so I'm not sure. Whether you, on one hand, you trivialized it, and on the other hand, you you indicated it towards the major changes that that could occur. Okay. Um, anyone else for this cluster? One more person. Yes. Oh, look, there's someone in front. Yeah. We'll come back to you. Uh, Hi, sir. I'd like to know how you differentiate these four horsemen yeah. from. Um, the readers list and inspectors of marks, which you severely criticized and agreed with what I do. Okay. So I'd like to know how you, uh, yeah, how you differentiate these two okay. lists. Okay. But now it's five, please. Yeah, no, I'm just going to add one of my own. It's very short, so it's just like a footnote, okay? It, 
you say in halfway through your talk, quote, only a strong dose of the left will save liberal prudence. Got it right? You say it. Only a strong dose of the left will go right. right. What is the what is the symbolic value of left here? What is you know, given all the heritage, given your problems with the traditional left, the social democratic left, and so on, how are we to, to read the left in this context? And in your okay. Writing? now. Okay. In other words, yeah, yeah you know, you got it. Okay. <laughs> I will try to to be brief. The first one uh, was uh, what if the this anti-immigrant and so on becomes even the leading one. This will be for me the name of the catastrophe because I claim that I my God, it's so sad that I don't have time to develop it. But this was a wonderful stage. Why? Because you know how often in a political space. Formally, all possibilities are open, but de facto, something cannot happen. And I claim that the way this new stability, not stability, service, is emerging, the whole point is that the anti-immigrant right should remain the second one. And this, I think, will be, I agree with you that this will probably happen, but this will be then a catastrophe. Or not even necessarily, uh, you know what I mean, like the whole logic of the system will be that the, uh, the extreme anti-immigrant uh, anti right will be like kind of a spectre haunting the democratic pluralist majority. Now already with Berlusconi, I admit it, this gets complicated because Berlusconi is already, to put it in ironic Marxist terms, and a dialectical synthesis of the two, no? He's at the same time pure liberal blah blah and elements of populism. So I think that this will be the crucial political moment. Maybe this will open a space for alliance of left and liberals. We can be optimists, but we can also be pessimists. All I'm saying is that this is something that in the inherent logic of the emerging system shouldn't have happened. In the logic which is remaining, which is in power now, the most that should happen is that these anti-immigrants are the secondary partner in a coalition. For them to take over directly, it's a very risky situation where, again, it's truly, as Mao said, like the heaven is in disorders, but I wouldn't say the situation is excellent, I would say the situation is interesting. And you know, in China, I checked it up, they, they really have this proverb, when you really hate someone, you tell him, may you live in interesting times, because this is bad. <laughs> so, okay, the second one, institutions of democracy. No, 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 I, all I dismiss, and even that, I didn't dismiss it in the sense of let's abolish it. I mean, I'm not a complete idiot, that is to say. If you ask me, would you rather live in a multi-party democracy or in North Korea or even more, more civilized uh, Stalin, uh, Stalinist state, there is no doubt about it. All I'm saying is that the existing state institutions of democracy are not enough, that another political dynamic is needed, and at the same time, I hope you will like this, uh, I not I deeply agree with your point of institutions. I'm not a spontaneous. You know, let me remind you of something. Gramsci, we all pretend to like him. You know that in the early twenties he was writing his texts. You know what was the name of the journal? Il Ordine Nuovo, the new order. As you probably know better than me, immediately afterwards this term was appropriated by the extreme right where it's still firmly at its place. So if today you say Europe needs a new order, haha, <laughs> no? Like, uh, but I think that maybe, not the term, it's a strategic decision if the term can be saved. The tendency, it should be revived. I mean, I hate the left which likes these enthusiastic moments, oh, we will all dancing on the street and so on. Uh, what I like is the morning after, you know. <laughs> we all can have, uh, what do I mean by this, that I hate this kind of a left? Listen, show me one great right winger today whose point of pride in his biography is not, of course, where was, where was I when I was young? 
on 68, I was on barricades and so on and so on. This is part of the biography of every respectable left uh, right winger today. No? So again, yes, I share this with you. I'm only saying that institutions, not just some wild democratic opinion pressure. The problem is to institutionalize this excess over the pure multi-party forum. Left, right. Excellent question. Again, my God, I hate you. These questions are not enough stupid. You really make me. <laughs> but I deeply agree with you. But my solution is here extremely dogmatic and simple. Listen, with all my, uh, all my sympathies for Palestinians, and I really mean it, I nonetheless think I never, never accept the idea of, how to put it, strategic alliance with anti-Semites, you know. You know, this patronizing justification of it, saying like, you know, Palestinians were to such an extent screwed up by the Zionists that, you know, they don't really mean it, we should tolerate a little bit of anti No, absolutely. I claim that it's a structural necessity that whenever, the moment, if there is something, and thereby I may be even asking, answering a little bit your final question. For me, authentic left means you acknowledge the priority of social conflict, formally, in the sense of, and this is the zero level of anti-Semitism is to deny this. The basic operation of an anti-Semite is to say, no, our society is its in, in inherent structure harmonious, we have conflict struggles because of that intruder from outside. And this is why I claim that whenever you find in the left even minimal traces of real anti-Semitism, it means that the left became, in the sense that I described earlier, a socialist left. This kind of organic left and so on and so on. And I include and everyone here, including of Chavez. I think that he's, from time to time, he does a remark which points in that direction. Well, no wonder that he, his friends now are Mugabe, Ahmadinejad, Lukashenko, and so on. No? It's for me rather a deep, deeper sign of problems with Venezuelan revolution. With, so uh, again, for me, this is not a problem, and I'm absolutely radically opposed to it. I mean, this deadly logic of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Then you do, this is, this is the formula of Stalin-Hitler pact, and so on, no? Okay, now it's this, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, sorry, the contradiction, no? That is to say, on the one hand, I take seriously ecology, on the other hand, superstition. But you know what I would say? No, I think I can save myself here. Yes. That precisely where, where ideology enters is this pseudo-personification that without I mean, my God, my source here is somebody who, at least admitted, cannot be accused of being a communist, Al Gore, who in his book makes a very nice point of how big companies like to spread the guilt and make everyone guilty, like, do you consume, you are guilty, to mask us, to mask up specifically their guilt. So all I'm saying is that, no, the problem is extremely serious, but translating it into the terms of these small everyday acts, which basically just feel you well, is just blurry. It's, it's to make you feel good. It's just what I like to quote that proverbial, you know, you go to Starbucks, you pay more for a cappuccino because you are told some money will go to the poor children of Guatemala, and it's wonderful. You go on consuming, but this is the genius of capitalism. In the commodity itself, the price of your leftist, honest resistance to consumerism is included. <laughs> but you pay the price so that you can say that it wasn't only consumerism, only against this side. Otherwise, I'm totally for ah, that question. For for this is a nice, and I hope I like evil men, even evil women, even more. Uh, uh, I uh, hope you meant it in an evil, cynical way. Like, uh, is, don't you have the same confusion beneath as Derrida does in this pathetic, moralistic listing of all bad phenomena that happen today? 
I think it's about one third into the specters of Marx. No, this list of multinational organization, this, that. No, I claim I have a consistency because they are all strictly problems of commons. First, the three spheres of commons, commons of nature, ecology, uh, commons intellectual property, so, uh, that is to say symbolic commons and biogenetics, which is our common inheritance are biogenetic commons, and the last one, new forms of apartheid, only radicalizes this into the very forum of is there a common space, are we all citizens, are some people, as Agamben would have put it, homo sacer, and so on and so on. So I claim that nonetheless, in contrast to Derrida, there is a clear line. Now, uh, what do I mean by this uh, leftist... Uh, 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 let I claim in a very traditional way, this is why provocative I mentioned those four, uh, four features that are included, no? I still think, and maybe I'm wrong, in spite of all this postmodern uh, poetry, you know how we are in autopoetic times, multitude and so on, I still am ready to inscribe myself into that, what we usually dismiss as a proto-totalitarian, millenarian legacy, you know, these explosions from time to time of this justice now, even if blood is flowing, we have to do it. I mean, I don't always agree with them. Of course, I wouldn't like to be there when the mob goes crazy and so on. But I claim this is kind of a brutal, elementary, ethico-political reaction. The point is not to abolish. The point is precisely il nuovo ordine, the, as Gramsci would. The point is precisely, does this legacy of revolutionary terror have to remain just that? Uh, totalitarian explosion, killing public rage, or can it be stabilized in a new order? It can, and I will give you a triumphant, for me at least, example, at least if we accept the Lefort, Claude Lefort, whom I still respect deeply, reading, democracy itself, democracy is terror institutionalized, in what sense? The target of every revolutionary terror, which is brutally egalitarian, is cut off the heads of those who want to be above. But is it that what democracy does in this radical European sense is precisely to presuppose that the purge is done. As Lefort put it, the space of the power is empty. This is the element of terror, and then you, you set up regulations how someone can, only for the time being, maybe, you know what I want to say? <coughs> This is a model example, even formal democracy, free elections, on how terror can be deprived of this destructive dimension in the sense of made, like, the empty place of power means that cuts are head off. You know, it can be institutionalized in this sense. So, uh, in this sense, I'm claiming, this is why if one identifies by left, not only, I know history, not as much as you, of democracy, but I know that the way what left means started, I don't know, different moments, maybe English 18th century, 19th century, but even a little bit more, I would say that basic legacy, as they like to put it in pathetic terms, from Spartacus to Thomas Nixon and so on and so on, I'm still ready to be part of that legacy. Admitting all its horror, I think that the task today is how to make out of it a new positive order, a little bit one step further than democracy. Well, it's getting on, and getting on means we have to protect the time of the staff here in this building who want us out by a certain time. But I would like to get at least five more questions. So let's have Mike. Can we have a mic down here, please? Can you come down? Right now, yeah. Can you bring the mic down to the front? Front, 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 front. No, front, front, front. You didn't organize it well. Didn't you distribute the questions like you started this No, this is, this is a free speech. Public use, public use of reason. <coughs> yeah. um, which I kind of agree with. But you seem to uh, imply that uh, we are starting now from a point of intellectual and philosophical non foundationalism. So no? Non foundationalism. But, so, where would you situate your um, I do radical critique um, within that? If you were a philosopher? Here. This, I, uh, I, 
In the middle? Have you got a question? No, it's the How do you accept questions from the right and you ignore the left? It's random. It's random. I think I'm more on the left than you are anyway. Go on. Despite that. Uh, as academics, uh, how do you... The Caribbean correctly was incest. It was. Okay. Yeah, and straight, Mike, straight back. Thanks. I just, uh, you didn't get a chance to actually return to what you wanted to talk about, but you returned to Hegel, and I wonder if you could just talk about uh, why you're going back to Hegel. Okay, several questions. Okay, several questions on the left. Left, 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 left. Okay, I, I know many of you want to ask questions, but we really have to be... This will have, have to be the last question. Yeah. And then we don't have to. You briefly referred to the difficult questions posed by some of the new, more efficient capitalist systems in the East. And I just wondered whether, in, 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 in relation to systems such as Dubai and, and China, you think that you, they could get to anywhere near the new leftist order that you're talking about without first going through the Western style of liberal democratization. Okay, well I regret that will be the last question, uh, but there is a book signing afterwards and maybe you can sneak one in then. Okay. But let's keep it... Okay, I will begin at the end, New Order, China, Dubai. First, I nonetheless would not in any way put them into the same category. Dubai is just a slave owning, I mean, Dubai is really, 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 like, a bad thing, I think. Like, there I become a fraud terrorist, almost. I mean, no, seriously, because you know that even the United Nations Sun Committee formally declared that what they are doing with uh, workers to do the dirty work is a form of slavery, and so on. So, uh, okay, I will say China is doing the same, but it's different. As for China, you know, for me, it's still an open situation. I wouldn't like to dismiss China simply as, uh, 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 you know, the new Asiatic authoritarian capitalism and so on and so on. Interesting things are happening there, I was told. For example, all those farmers inland who are not part of this new booming prosperity, at least for some people on, on the eastern coast, are now organizing themselves in this Solidarno style, half political, apolitical way. You know, like saying just our interest, but it's politics. And, and you know, in China, we are talking about real numbers. Like, we are talking about, I was told, like 200 million farmers already doing networks. And I was told by, not by party representative, but by some half dissident, at least that the Communist Party is seriously considering admitting them as a partner for the first time. Because, why? Because they are intelligent enough to get it that if they don't do this, they risk much stronger explosions. So this would be, you see, for me, an example of what the lady before asked me, these institutions of democracy and so on. For me, it's not only this pure bourgeois, multi-party democracy, it's this concrete articulation of interests and so on. So maybe something will become out of China and I don't think they necessarily have to go through our, here I'm, I'm not a, a, a Eurocentrist, to our Western. They will have to reinvent a more radical democracy if they will in their own way. But things are looking bad. You know why? Because here I was disappointed in China. Because both sides, as far as I was able to guess, that is to say, the left and, uh, sorry, the official party politicians and the dissidents, have dissidents accept the same reference in Confucianism. Only the party gives to it a more organic, proto-fascist uh, face. The dissidents more this, you know, consultation, respect, civility, and so on and so on. And I think this will not work. But again, my answer is still very pragmatic. Okay, I'm going backwards now. Hegel. Oh, my God, this is so difficult to go into it. But, uh, okay, just to give you one hint. I think we should reread Hegel's problematic of Pöbel, rebel. Usually it is right, Hegel was there half an idiot in the sense of 
getting on something very interesting, how a whole strata is necessarily produced by society, which is in its very wealth, not wealth, so that the more you are wealthy, the less you can take care of the poor and so on. But usually it's read retroactively from Marxism. That Hegel just didn't get that it's not a rebel lumpen proletariat, but the proper working class and so on. I think that today, where we no longer can talk about the traditional working class, but about at least four or five multiplicity of potential agents, people in slums, yes, working class, intellectual workers, uh, unemployed, and so on and so on, that also maybe we should return to Hegel a little bit to his notion of, of rebel. Hegel only is at one point not consequent enough there, measured by his own standards. For him, the rebel are those outcasts, produced by society but with no proper place within the society. Following his own dialectical approach, he should have said this is a formal dialectical necessity, that precisely those without proper particular place embody the universality. Hegel doesn't say this, typically. Rebel is only a rebel. Okay, but cannot go on here. Uh, incest and so on. I don't know, I take the question very seriously, but probably we agree I should have known more about the proper background of the question. Because, you know, when you say incest, uh, all, my first association is just almost intended to say a very conservative one. It is that, you know, Often, and this is why I have a great distrust into uh, art, avant-garde, and so on. One way to make it sure that you, you can play it safely, that you don't risk a lot, is to be over-radical. You know, like you demand too much and you know nothing will happen. Often it's much more subversive to pose a very modest demand. In this sense, I don't think, at least maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see anything mega subversive in saying against the we should also render thematic the topic of incest or whatever. I even claim I don't think it would have been something very uh, something very revolutionary to do it or to be very vulgar. As far as I know, in some Scandinavian countries and so on, at least in Norway, they are simply considering, they, are, they already tolerate sister, brother, incest. Okay, my mommy is not yet there waiting for me, but they are coming close. You know what I mean? To be short, I can easily imagine a liberal, liberal developer of private sexual practices, late capitalist society which says you want to screw your mother, your problem, her problem. Like, you know what I mean? Like, or to, be, to put it, and I'm consciously ironic here, no? I, it's much easier for me, for a liberal government, to imagine it, to imagine it allowing incest, than to, to imagine it doing a little bit more for healthcare service. <laughs> no, that's my problem. It, it's, oh, okay. Now, then, there was, uh, uh, yeah, Facebook. I'm sorry, I've been deeply disappointed by a very traditional answer. I think it's, the struggle is open. It's a contradictory phenomenon. On the one hand, it is what you said. It plays a wonderful role. But as we know, it's not only Facebook. It's also cell phones, whatever you want, people that such and so on. I mean, in, for example, the situation that I know relatively well in Iranian revolution, Musabi, it was the same and so on, which is, again, the government also cut down the <coughs> internet, which is why our beloved leader, the last true democrat, in the known universe, Kim Jong-il totally blocks the uh, But on the other hand, it's also, I don't know, personally, although there were idiots who claimed that they are me and on, on Facebook, I learned that I can, this was the truth, the intimate experience of the December subject out there. <laughs> I learned that there are two, three sides like Hugh speaks and so on about whom I didn't know anything and so on. And what annoyed me is that they imitated my style, but then often adopted positions which were not mine. For example, you remember when Polanski was arrested? They said, oh, I protested. I'm sorry, this will be a shock for you, but here I'm a traditional moralist. Fuck him, he screwed brutally a young girl. Fuck him. <laughs> A little bit more in the politically correct. So again, 
But it's very important not to fall into this Frankfurt School. This is where they are at their worst track of, you know, only telling the dark side. I, I can imagine a donor who would say, Facebook, horror, don't let me <laughs> <laughs> Struggle goes on there. Uh, then, uh, foundationalism, uh, when, uh, when, when, okay, my second song, this may surprise you, but first, uh, you know, it's very fascinating in this postmodern way to criticize foundational, like, you know, to say non foundationalist thought and so on and so on. I'm not part of that. I believe in, I think that. So this is why, in spite of all my disagreements with him, I uh, disagree. Uh, I, sorry, uh, disagreements I agree with, but you. The time I think of that uh, cultural studies, historicist relativism, where all, let's call them naively, ontological questions were prohibited. You know, like if you, I ask somebody, what does this? a uh, glass of water stand for what it is. They will say, no, the only question you are allowed to ask is, under what discursive conditions can we talk about this as a glass of water and so on and so on. Or a more serious, real-life example, you are not allowed to ask the question, am I free as a human being? They would say, ah, under what epistemic conditions can we talk about freedom and so on and so on. I claim that there always was a wild resistance to it. I claim that this is one of the reasons why cognitive scientists, Darwinians, and uh, Stephen Hawking's one to physicist and so on, were so popular. It is as if that they were, were feeling in this metaphysical first. What you get from them is basically answer to big metaphysical questions. And I think that uh, it's clear that this relativist uh, historicism is an untenable position, and Shamelessly, I'm not afraid to say I'm an ultra strong foundationalist, and my slogan is back to Hegel. Even the thesis of my book will be Hegelian materialist reversal of Marx. That Hegel was much more a materialist than Marx, that we should go back to Hegel. That Marx was unfortunately way too much part of that horrible post Hegelian reaction which you find in different ways, in Marx, in, uh, in, Marx, in, 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 in Kierkegaard, in Schopenhauer Schelling, that you say, oh, philosophy is caught in its own narcissistic, masturbatory, Marx uses the metaphor, uh, 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 circulation of ideas, we need to find a real-life foundation. For Marx, real-life productive process, for Schelling and Schopenhauer, the willing for Kierkegaard existential belief, and so on and so on. I think that, and here I follow the one who is also not an idiot, the only really good chapter of this book, I think, is the third one, on critical political <laughs> Where I try to, I follow Moshe Boston, that guy from the University of Chicago, uh, who tries to develop how what Marx effectively does from mid-50s, returning to critique of political economy, is something which is a break with what we associate with Marxism. You know, German ideology and all those primitive dismissals like in contrast to speculative idealism which starts with abstract ideas, we begin with real people, blah, blah, blah. This is not at all what Marx is doing in capital. So that if there is a Marx for which I am, is, is that Marx which did what every self-decent person does, leftist. You know, when you are in deep shit, revolution phase, you go to Switzerland or wherever and you start reading Hegel. Marx is <laughs> in the mid-50s after the failure of the European revolutions. Lenin did this in 1915 and we should be doing it today. Like, like, so. Well, before we, we thank you for my just announcement, the whole book will be on sale outside of this moment. Or if you just want chapter three, maybe they will do a discount for you. Um, uh, when we depart, when, you, when we finally said thank you, um, the speaker and I are going to leave first, so can I ask you just to stay seated till we've gone, so we can get out there and get ready to sign the books. Okay? This is your totalitarian approach. It doesn't matter, it's going to happen anyway. <laughs> and so, what do we say? What a fantastic evening, what an entertaining oh. evening, what an engaging evening.
here to here. Wouldn't it be nice if I come next year again and we step out of this clowning idea jokes and we do some real Hegel Marx stuff about okay, it. Okay, that's a joke. I, I know that there is some kind of dialectical law of quantity into quality that when you have above a certain number of people, it becomes a spectacle. But maybe not. Maybe we can do it and have a more... Maybe I am ready to take a risk and constrain myself and less dirty jokes but more conceptual thinking. Especially because you, LSC, have a tradition of not... Uh, not the most I tell about you, you know. It's easy to praise people. If you say, oh, what a genius. No problem, because you know, when you praise people, it means I am higher than you, I can praise you, you know. If I really appreciate, I don't praise them, I fear them, I hope they will have a heart attack, no? <laughs> the most I can tell of people is that they are not complete idiots, no? Everybody can be a genius. Very few people, so I think here at least some people were not complete idiots. So let's <laughs> us non-complete idiots get together. Let's do it. <laughs>